Joseph. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Albert, for this invitation to this for this seminar and for the my short biography. Thank you again. And good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everybody. I don't know exactly which time of the world you are following the seminar. And uh, um, I'll sorry. Okay, I think we could start. My talk essentially will be on the uh, new procedure or the procedure for um, dealing with the problem of warning flood risk, specifically proving of flood risk in the urban area, uh, using a quite well known in, uh, in the practical application for flood, for flood warning, which is the rainfall thresholds techniques, which comes from the flash flood guidelines idea, which is implemented in many parts of the United States, for instance. So, uh, this is where we, you can see the main outlines of my talk. Essentially, we describe the methodology for the ratio of rainfall threshold in this specific case. And I will show how we, uh, how we will deal with some typical peculiar problems which uh, you can have when dealing with uh, pluvial flooding, standard classical flood or pluvial flooding, other kind of floods. This will be, uh, will be show uh, the procedure with based essentially on the Monte Carlo, which Monte Carlo procedure, which put together um, hydrodynamic modeling with a stochastic rainfall generator, which is the forcing essentially of the pluvial flooding. Uh, using specific foundation criteria. At, at the end, I will show the results of this methodology for the derivation of rainfall thresholds. Uh, okay, <clears throat> which is the problem? Uh, you know, fault forecasting, fault warning uh, is a quite well known problem in agrological applications and in flood risk management applications. But when you are in a particular situation, like urban areas or small catchments, uh, it becomes a rather complicated task because uh, the plot of flood formation, flash flood formation generally is a very, very fast phenomenon. So the timing of phenomena is in the order of few minutes, in some cases, few hours, but in the majority of cases, it a few minutes. And the dynamics of runoff, especially runoff on the surface of this kind of catchments, show very complex behaviors. It's not a classical rainfall runoff transformation you can have in a, a natural catchment. So in this case, implementing a system for flash flood or for put of flood in this case, forecasting a warning is using the classical techniques of real time or complex modeling or other kind of well-known modern user in the practical application is a little bit more complicated. So one, uh, possible solution is working on the so-called agrological precursors. The agrological precursors as a, a sort of agrological tools, which can be used normally offline and sometimes, in some cases also online, which allows to have an immediate information on the flood conditions, on the risk condition, and immediately issue a warning. This of course, the particular, these particular kinds of logical precursors are the rainfall thresholds. So what are the rainfall thresholds? Maybe all of you will know or have seen in other situation this, this figure. Uh, the rainfall threshold is this, this curve, which is essentially is the volume of the rainfall that is enough to cause critical condition and a sort of control and cross-section of the catchment. So you can see this blue curve. In, uh, in, uh, in this plot of time, the rainfall amount. Of course, the amount of rainfall increases with time. So each point of this blue curve represents a condition of critical in which so there is a, a, a limit of, you know, alert, not alert, or warning or warning, critical, non-critical situation. So in above the curves with the critical conditions, below the curve of the non-critical condition. The point is exactly the limits. So why it's very, why this kind of tool is useful and powerful? Because you simply use this curve, which can be derived offline, 
So it's not a car which should arrive during the event, but offline, you know, in summertime, for instance, when you don't have a problem with flooding. So you calculate this curve, and when winter began, you can use this curve by comparing with the rainfall. With the rainfall, it can be observed rainfall, and you can see, and also, if you have, also with forecast rainfall, and found a point, so when the cool of the rainfall cross the rainfall threshold, this point shows the warning condition. So this means that this curve incorporates two main information. One are the critical conditions, which uh, you consider as significant for your warning. As normally, are a critical discharge in a real cross-section or a critical water stage in the same cross-section. Uh, because essentially the theory of rainfall thresholds started with the natural catchments. And of course, the rainfall thresholds is derived, is, is, it, it's an easy tool because it is derived from the solution of the hydrologic inverse problem. So essentially, it is the rainfall amount which produces a certain discharge. So this means if you have discharge, you go, go back to the to the <clears throat> sorry, to the critical to the rainfall and obtain the rainfall threshold. So as you can see in the, in the slides, this curves comes from the solution of the classical hydrologic inverse problem. So it means the rainfall runoff modeling in the catchment. Of course, if you are in urban catchment you are working or dealing with a pool of flooding, the sense of hydrologic inverse problem is a little bit different. I would say it's very different. You don't have a real rainfall runoff transformation like we, we know in the classical case. The, the, the situation is more complicated because essentially the, uh, for the flood formation is due to the movement of the water in a very complex environment due to the rainfall, which is, of course, in part reduced by infiltration if you have green areas in your cities, in your urban areas. But in some cases, essentially, are the, <clears throat> the water which fall on, on the roads and come down. So the hydrologic inverse problem is essentially related not to the rainfall runoff modeling, but to the surface inundation propagation modeling. In the definition of the uh, rainfall thresholds, you have to define which are the critical conditions for you as users of this tool. And normally are critical discharge, it means maximum discharge in some cross section of the river or a water stage. But again, if you are working or if you are dealing with pluvial flooding, the sense of the critical condition is something different. You don't have a river cross section, a specific river cross section, because there is a propagation in a complex, in a very complex system. So there is. <clears throat> so you have to find a new, a new meaning. For critical condition and try to include this new critical condition into the rainfall thresholds. Essentially, <clears throat> this can be done using a sort of inundation criteria. So you are not interested in the discharge, but you are more interested in flooding, in inundation, in water moving, spreading, and flooding in the area. Of course, you can use it. this criteria can also be applied to a natural river if you want, you know? but uh, it's absolutely necessary for urban areas. <clears throat> so the methodology: how we uh, implement the methodology? As I, I anticipated before. The methodology is uh, as based essentially on a Monte Carlo procedure. Uh, this, why, why Monte Carlo? Why stochastic generation? Because there are a, a lot of complex, complex relationships between different models you can see in this line, 
with a lot of non-linearities and uh, difficulties to interpret it separately. So the best thing to do is to generate different scenarios and different situations, put all together and see the final results. So essentially, we started from a definition of synthetic graph. The idea was the rainfall forcing was the main forcing, especially for the case I will show later. Uh, is the main forcing for this kind of situation. The yetto graph are used as input to an inundation modeling, so a model for surface inundation. These models returns what? From the flooding, flooded area, what depth, velocity, extension of flooded area, which can be used to see what happens in your area, and of course to use as input to the inundation criteria analysis, which is in this case particularly, is based on the use of depth damage curve, so classical, but based on the water depth damage and percentage of inundated area. And on the base of this inundation criteria, of course, you can recognize a single point or a single information for each couple or each yet graph given a specific initial criteria. This means the threshold variation. The, the, the the or clear. Uh, <clears throat> first, the inundation modeling. Uh, the uh, case study and the application I show you later, and in general, the situation in urban areas requires a very detailed model for modeling pluvial flood implementation. And essentially 2D modeling, because you know, urbanized areas are very complex, roads, streets, buildings, uh, squares, and so on. So you need a, a, a propagation very, to recognize very complex propagation. So we started for using a, a model, which is flood QD, and this model was by, developed by myself, unfortunately, many years ago, <laughs> when, when I worked my PhD. It is a, a model, a classical hydraulic hydrodynamic model based on the sum and equation in the inertial mode. It was originally uh, developed for simulating the overland flow propagation on floodplains, but was modified in this case to take into account the peculiar situation of the urban areas, like, for instance, main homes or converts or other complicated stuff we can find in, <clears throat> in, in your areas. The equations, which are quite well-known equations, uh, were solved, are solved by using fine element technique with triangular elements. And why fine element and why triangular elements? Because you can see from this uh, picture, this, no, uh, this picture, it is a, a, a detail of the study area we used for this presentation. The five elements allows to model a very complex topography because for the geometrical characteristics like blocks, streets, you can see in the, in the, in the figure the white, the white area are the blocks, which is essentially modeled as an island, and the triangle elements can model in a very detailed way all the roads and the small roads and the small, I would say, lanes beneath or among the different blocks. And this is, of course, is connected with a very robust resolution uh, of the equation we can get a very important information like velocity and water depth at each node of the mesh. So it needs a very detailed spatial distributed information. Okay. Uh, what's about the inundation criteria? Well, usually, usually, the uh, inundation criteria for some other application in this field are essentially based only on the water depth, because all the depth, the water depth, are the main variable which leads to the damage. And as you can see, 
The water depth also used here uh, as a primary information essentially to define the percentage of damage. So this means to use a vulnerability function because essentially the, 90, the majority of vulnerability function for the exposed elements are derived in the form of water depth. So the thresholds are essentially calculated <clears throat> starting from the critical water depth, depending from this uh, relative damage function, using a critical percentage of, uh, percentage of inundated area of the total area, because you can also you can have also critical condition in two situations. One, very high water depth, or if water depth are not very high, but the, you have a large inundated area, this is also another critical condition. So the idea is to put together this information. And the rainfall threshold in this case is very easy because the rainfall threshold is calculated as the water depth, uh, sorry, the rainfall amount at the time, which is ca called the time of inundation, which is the first time step when the maximum simulated water depth and corresponding flood area exceed specific inundation criteria. So when you recognize the, the exact point in which you have the same time of water depth and the inundated area over a specific or exceeding a specific inundation criteria, this is the time to inundation which is the one you use for the rainy rainfall threshold as a cumulative of the rainfall depth from the starting of the event to that time of inundation. And uh, <clears throat> at the bottom you see the vulnerability function we, we use for this application, which is, was derived for another study uh, in the other urban area, which is not the one I show, I show you now, but in a very similar urban area in another part of Sicily, which is characterized by a similar building topology. So you can see essentially you have from you know, this, this car gives you the percentage of damage given the water depth. So, oh, this is the case study <clears throat> in which we apply the procedure. Uh, we are in uh, uh, this uh, part of the uh, urban area of Palermo is called Mondello Urban Catchment. It is a uh, nice, you can see from the picture on the left, it's a ni nice area close to the sea, which is now one of the most residential, you know, luxurious area of the city of Palermo. Um, and essentially, it's a very flat area, totally urbanized, you can see from the picture on the right. And as, because many years ago was last century, this was a marsh, so it was a flat area which is subjected to flooding because the water comes from, from the rainfall and remains on the area, so it's difficult to drain. So pure flooding is, uh, you know, the maybe the plug of this area. Also, if you look in the two pictures on the left, in the upper part, you see the area now, uh, on the middle, in black and white, you can see the area was among between 50 and 60 years ago. So it was a flat area, totally rural, rural, no buildings at all, no roads. So there was a strong urban expansion in, uh, in, the, last, in the last area. And of course, we have a, a, a strong expansion in terms, in urbanistic terms, but this fast urbanization was not linked to the adequate drainage system. So, during the rainfall events, the runoff volumes mainly propagate along the roads and produce pluvial and surface flooding, as you can see from the three pictures in the bottom of the slide. So, these are not a, there is no river here, so not specific river, no specific catchment. It's a flat area in which the rain the rainfall arrives and remains and propagates and along the roads which are between the villas and the other buildings and the city. So for the application of procedure, first step was to derive the information for the rainfall to define a synthetic data graph to be used as an input 
to the hydro dynamic model. As such, I will collect data from two rainfall, from two rain waves, sorry, which are not far from the area, just a couple of kilometers far from the from the areas. And uh, <clears throat> the rainfall data are available from August 2001 to September 2014, with very high resolution, times 10 minutes resolution, so to catch the extreme uh, intense rainfall. Don't forget we are in Sicily, so essentially the extreme events in terms of fault formation are events with high intensity and very, very short duration. So a few hours uh, in the maximum one day, no more, no more. So we're selected from these, from the total, to the total sample of the, of the rainfall, we selected 123 independent and significant rainfall events, which were separated by a dry period of three hours and with, with, a, a, with a, 10, a 10 minutes peak intensity greater than 20 millimeters per hour. So we selected only the significant in, in terms of flood formation events. You can see on the table the characteristics of the event selected. Uh, these events were used for uh, deriving the rainfall storm structure. Just to, this was done because to force the hydrodynamic model, uh, the idea was not to use a classical synthetic heatograph in terms of shape like rectangular or triangular or any kind of this, or Chicago yetograph, but we work it on the real, on the real rainfall storm structure. So you can see in the in the figure on the level. So the other uh, on below. So this dimensional is yetograph used for the simulation. And on, with the, uh, the black Y, you can see the 5% and 90% percentile curves of the old events generated. <clears throat> so this, uh, all this, you know, this uh, information on storm structure was was used for the generation of the single generated rainstorm yetograph. Regarding the storm characteristics like duration and total volume, it was sampled in a uniform, start from uniform distribution, in the limits of the connection or so <clears throat> did you Sorry, it seems that we are having some technical issue now. Now? Yes. Okay, Please continue, good. thank you. Okay, I don't know what's, what exactly happened. <laughs> so, uh, so, essentially the, pro the procedure allowed to generate, we generate 1,000 rainstorm yetographs using a sampling uniform of the rainfall storm structure, or the rainfall 
some fraction in the, in the range of the percentiles and uh, a uniform sampling of duration and <clears throat> sorry and total volume. On the right, you can see an example of one of the generated arrays from the photograph. You can see duration, minutes, and array for intensity, etc. Okay. So after that, we have the <coughs> the uh, the array for full sync, the input to hydrodynamic model. Next step is to uh, derive the pool of flooding, so the inundation modeling in the area. So, uh, not, not the entire area was modeled, hydrodynamic uh, modeling. You can see, look on the, on the right, there is a red line. This red line represents a drainage convey system, which is on the back of the main area, which essentially collects the 90-90% of the water coming from this part but doesn't collect water directly falling on this area. So we decide to model it only this part, which is not protected by any kind of drainage system, and so it's completely exposed to the flooding. You can see on the right, on the left, sorry, is the DM, the two meters resolution DM, the lighter dam of the area. You can see this, uh, this bit before, which is a quite flat area. Comes from zero, the seaside, to essentially <clears throat> two meters. There are some points which are a little bit higher because are more natural. We just sort of small, small garden here. So it's 3.8, 3.6, but the majority of the area is very, very flat. So perfectly, it's a perfect case of pure flat. This is the uh, Van Hammond mesh used for the simulation. Uh, <clears throat> It is more than 20,000 20, tram elements and more than 30,000 nodes. You can see they, uh, the holes in the mesh are the blocks, are the blocks in the area. Okay, so, uh, and we use this for the simulation. This is an example of one 1,000 single joint simulation for a given scenario of rainfall duration and volume. So you can see the simulation of water depth in the different points, you see again the, the white, the white hole or subject to flooding, other less, you can see this information. What's about the initial criteria? So the initial criteria was derived starting from the vulnerability curves in terms of the water depth and percentage of damage, but it was put together with information of the percentage of inundated area, and because, of course, we know the economic value of the area, of the, of the assets in the area, it was possible to define a sort of damage level. So you have damage levels, which is a combination of water depth and, surf and a percentage of inundated area. In particular, for the, this primary analysis, we, we use uh, three different damage levels, 2%, 5%, 10%. This means that 2% is a 2% of the total damage of the assets in terms of the residential building time in the area, 5% and 10%. The result of these analyses are this kind of curves, which put together the inundation, inundated area percentage and the flooding depth. So each point for each curve represents the situation in which we have blue 2% of the total damage in the area, 5% and 10%. So you have 10%, for instance, when you have 40% of the water depth of, and 20% of inundated area, and so on for the other points. Using this, is it possible to derive directly for inundated simul from the hydrodynamic simulation the exact time in which you reach the inundation criteria and put together with the rainfall amount. This is the, rain, this is the final results. This, uh, I will show you all for 2% of damage level. Each point represents the pair of time to inundation rainfall volume under a specific inundation criteria. 
So these points are related only to those events in 1,000 events, which produce flooding according with the relation criteria. And this red one is the interpolation of this, so you can use essentially the rental threshold. The red curve represents the critical conditions in terms of 2% of damage level, of course, it can be 5%, 10%, or any kind of damage level, for all the simulation for hydrodynamic model. And of course, the rainfall volume and duration can give this information. Simply compare this curve with the rainfall <coughs> volume measured or forecasted anything you want, and you can issue the warning for the real flood. So I'll come to the conclusion. So this, the use of uh, thresholds is uh, very simple and can be a widely used method for flood risk management in this kind of situation as, uh, as is now a widely used method for flood risk management in natural catchment. The methodology is quite innovative because it is capable to include all peculiarities specific to the relation of rainfall threshold in urban areas, like, you know, flood propagation in terms of aerodynamic damage. The complex of inundation criteria has been considered and could be considered, should be considered instead of use of criteria's charge. The multi simulation allows to manage all the linearities of the process of a very complex problem, process, rainfall, Agri-line propagation, inundation criteria, response of the area. So you can put all together in this multi framework. Of course, the work in progress, we, of course, not finished. There are further developments. First of all, uh, the inundation model should be calibrated. We, the calibration is devoted to the uh, roughness coefficient we use for the, proper, for the, for the hydraulic for aerodynamic simulation. In this case, we use a single value from each area, a classical value from literature, 0.02 minimum coefficient. But the best things to do should be to calibrate the model using positive data like water depth, for instance. Inulation criteria in this case, in this first analysis, was based only on building residential type. But it's not, of course, you should consider also other different assets like touristic, industrials, commercial, and also indirect damages. The DM is two meters resolution, but for this kind of area, maybe more information and more detailed information can be derived in from micro topography. So this means DM with 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters resolution. Last but not least, if you go back, if you go back to the uh, plot of the rainfall threshold, you see the points are quite scattered along the single red line. So this means there is an uncertainty, and this should be correct to include a significant uncertain analysis to include in a quantitative way the uncertain bounds to add uncertain bounds to the rainfall threshold Thank you for your attention. Uh, that's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, it's very interesting talk. Uh, I think we still have a little bit time to take some more questions. Is anyone who want to raise any questions? You can directly ask. You don't need to type now. Yes, Mike, please. Hello. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, I was just interested in the, the 2D modeling and the buildings. Uh, are you, you're completely modeling that doesn't enter the buildings at all? No, I didn't uh, build it into the model at all. The building is completely impervious, close to the water. Are essentially, you know, these are essentially villas or you know, uh, classical building which are, we, we door, the door are closed and the windows also, so it, there is no many water in it. We didn't see any water into the buildings in all the events we analyzed, really. So when, when, when I go, when I go uh, after, uh, after one of these events in this area, there are uh, water outside in the roads, but no water at all into the buildings. 
So we decide to uh, not to consume any water into the building. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, what? please. Uh, yeah, this is Chuhua Liang from Newcastle. Um, I, I noticed that you didn't actually uh, look at the spatial pattern of the rainfall. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it because it's not important? Uh, because the area is very small. If you look at dimension, it's a, it's a quite small area because it's around, it's a the look. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, for this specific, you know, application, it is small. But you know, I think if you um, you're trying to uh, ex extend your model oh, yeah. for a bigger area. Yeah, you can, then... you can you you can do this because the hydrodynamic modeling is a distributed. You can consider a different rainfall at, for each single triangle element. This, of course, is too much, of course. But you can put also distributed rainfall with this with spatially variation of the rainfall if you want. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is because it's quite a small area. But you sure. can do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um hi. Um Robert, can I make a question? Yes, please, George. Yes, George. <laughs> okay, first of all, um thank you, Giuseppe, for the very nice uh, presentation. Um we are we are um, here in, in Munich um, running also a project which we are also very interested in uh, in flood uh, flood warning. Mm, uh, yeah. And um, picking up the, the last comment you got, uh, which has to do with that spatial variability. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, because you, you, you showed that you use historical events to build your um, your yetographs. Yeah. Uh, so Let's but go back to the, to, the, to the slide, sorry. If, if we know that the, in the area, uh, the hydrographs also change spatially, how do you think you could account for that? Uh, this, is, this is a good question. This is a very good question. It's very complicated to have a, a, a spatial distribution of the, uh, of the stone structure, if you would say, in the area. Because yeah. you, know, rainfall, you need rainfall feed. Unfortunately, in this area, there are not so many rain ages to uh, collect information about rainfall fields, especially with rainfall fields. Mm -hmm. But since a few years, um, there was a, a, radar, a, a weather radar installed in Palermo, so not far from this area, and started to collect information a couple of years ago. So I hope in the future to have... Uh, data from this radar to have a look of the spatial structure of the rainfall fields and try to include in the generation, multicolor generation, also the generation of rainfall fields. Yes. It is a quite, it's, it's a quite tricky, it's a quite tricky stuff. Really. <laughs> it, was not easy. it is, it is. Well, we are, uh, <laughs> the reason why I'm asking this is because we are uh, more or less struggling on that point, yeah, uh, quite, because if, if you try to increase to include these in a Monte Carlo simulation, then you end up with thousands of simulations because yeah. the variability can be enormous. Enormous, absolutely enormous. Now, the, 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 the lucky situation is the these areas, many areas, are not so large. They're not so yeah. big. Yeah. Big variation. Yeah. Of course, if you if you are discussing of Munich. Or Rome or Milan is different, of course. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. if you work on small catchment like this, uh, luckily we don't have a so large variation in, in space all the time. So that is quite tricky. We can discuss about it. We can discuss about this. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had one second point, yeah? and it it it's related with um, uh, with the last part with the with the damage. How how. This threshold you, you come up with based on the damage. You saw the last the the slides, right? Okay. Uh, yes. So it's yeah. so you're looking into the percentage of damage, and if this percentage of damage is um, is exceeded, then you issue your warning. Is that it? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So my issue with this is yeah. if we are using an average value, we are maybe skipping warnings in areas where um, where this area is not that, uh, homogeneous. Yeah, that's true. And, and, that's true. That, can be, that can be dangerous. Yeah, that's true. That's, true. that's right. In fact, this is, uh, 
if you look at the further developments, uh, you say the initial growth year should be based now on different assets. So yep. also including uh, the spatial variability of damage. Yes, in this I... application, we, we, we don't have any spatial variability. These are the average of the damage in the area. Of yes. course, you, you can have an average of 2% and the 30% of damage somewhere. That's true. Yes, it's true. And, and that's why I was thinking if, if the average is, is the best criteria, or if you should uh, look into uh, some extremes. Okay. Or, I, uh, I, I have the suggestion to use the average from the Civil Protection Agency of CISO. I okay. discussed with the man in charge of the, of the warning system, asking mm -hmm. him which is, the, which is the best criteria for them, for their operativity. And of course, they prefer to have a sort of average value, because if, you, if they start to work on the single peak, mm -hmm. It's it's quite complicated because you no, know, there in, will be too many peaks. In, in operational way, it's very very complicated to work on a single peak. This means to run, you run, you take people with uh, you know with cars or you know with with the rough roughs running in, in a single point or another single point. It's quite complicated to manage. So mm. they to have an idea on the average value. Also because the civil protection agents in charge of flood warning in CISO. We work essentially on forecasting, on, on, Pluga, on uh, rainfall forecasting, then rainfall measured. Mm -hmm. So Fred, you, to know the day before, which will be the average damage in some area. Okay. So this was you know, an, an, an injection of practical application, I would say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you, George. Thank, thank you, Joseph. Can we have one very last question? We are running out of time. If Absolutely. there's anyone. If not, and can I have the last one? Just yeah, further continue for the question. That's have in this case, would you also consider this kind of terrain variation in the future? So how would this change the slope or change the uh, threshold for warning? You said that the, the, the change in the, the terrain characteristic in terms of topography. Yes. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> this is the, the, you know, the, the, the short now, this is the, the DM now. I, I haven't taken account any change in the future. You okay. say the future or the past? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the past? Uh, probably in the future, you can try to further incorporate with this. Uh, well, the, is it, is the, it, is it possible? Yeah. Probably is it possible to do this, but uh, we don't have information about this. Yeah. This is a quite fixed area now, so there are no, no way to change really, because it will be static. But it could be interesting to include variation in topography in the future. Yeah. To see what will be happening as, you know, as a change in flood risk. That could be interesting. Maybe more buildings. In some parts, probably more buildings could be built. If you look, there are some green area here, and maybe in the future there will be more more villas or more building here. So you you and then new roads, a new way. That's going to be interesting to analyze the change in the DM on the end in the topography essentially, because the topography is the main the main actor of this uh, actor of this situation, the main factor of this situation. Mm -hmm. mm. I think about this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Yusef. I think we need to draw, uh, draw to the end. So the next uh, webinar will be uh, held at uh, on uh, 12th of June, and the speaker will be George Leandro from TU Munich, who is also our audience today. And the next one is will be on 10th of July, will be presented by Matt Roberts uh, from BMT WBM UK. So I will circulate the information soon and all the slides and the recording of video will be shared by our YouTube channel. And thank you very much for everyone for attending and hope to see you next time soon. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you for your questions and your interest in this, in this my presentation. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you, Albert, to you. Thank you, Joseph. Perfectly. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.